Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. We were supposed to talk about our primary purpose, and uh, when I sat down to do some thinking about this, well, actually what happened was we've been traveling around the wonderful United States of America for the last several weeks around Black Hills and Yellowstone and stuff like that, and I kind of got out of doing the dishes beside the camper because I told my good wife that I had to get ready for this talk, and being the good Alan on that she is, I sat under the awning and put together some thoughts, and I was going to share some lofty spiritual principles with you about the traditions and our primary purpose is to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers and bore you with some philosophical thought, but I don't know a lot of philosophical thoughts, and I guess the only way that I can share the primary purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous for me is to share with you how somebody shared it with me. So I'm going to have to tell you a little bit about me, I guess. So that's the only way I know about the primary purpose. I'd also like to share with you a couple of dates that are important in my life. And my non-alcoholic friend Mike talked about one of them last night. And the first date's June 10, 1935. And those of you in this room know what that date is. That's the date when an old drunk named Bill was walking around the lobby of a hotel. And he was lonesome and bored and he was trying to stay sober. And many of us in this room know about that. And he knew he had this thought that if he were to walk into a bar that he heard the music coming out of and the glasses clinking and laughter and things that he'd have some company. And he said to himself that he could maybe go in there and have some ginger ale or tomato juice or whatever non-alcoholics who were trying to con themselves drink in 1935. That he could go in there and share some fellowship and have some fun and be with some people. But of course, he played that head game many times before, as many of us have had. And he knew that if he went in there, that he would surely drink. And for him to drink again would be to die, the same as it would be for me and perhaps for some of you. And he made that phone call that Mike talked about last night, and God put him in touch with uh, Dr. Bob. As I understand the story, Bill talked to Ann, and, he, and Ann talked to Bob, and Bob agreed to talk to this lunatic from New York for about 15 minutes just to get this future Alan on off his back. Not a whole hell of a lot has changed, as far as I can figure. <laughs> and they came over and sat eyeball to eyeball and knee to knee and hand to hand and looked in each other's eyes and shared that story, one with each other, about what it was like and what happened and what it could be like. And that first miracle of what is now Alcoholics Anonymous happened that night. And they shared that message of recovery face to face. And I often think when I'm asked to think about things like this, and unfortunately I don't think about them often enough, only when I'm asked to think about them, I have to. I think about how that chain that happened in June 10th, 1935, was passed on one drunk to another, down through the various states in the United States and up into my country. So the second significant date in my life that I'd like to share with you, and that's July 21st, 1971. The morning of July 21st, 1971, I was walking back from a hotel in a place called Yorkton, Saskatchewan. The city has got about as many people in it as is probably sitting in this arena right now. And I was not in very good shape. To show you the depths to which I had fallen, I had taken to hanging out with social drinkers in the hope that something good would happen to me. (laughs) And I had, I'm, I'm duly addicted again, I'm also addicted to golf, and I had gone down with this social drinker. And uh, we had gone to watch the replay of some golf tournament. We were going to have a couple of beers and watch this golf thing and do some yucking and whatever one social drinkers do with functions like that. And we were going to go home, and that's exactly what he did. Some 10 or 12 hours later, I found myself staggering down the street of that small city in which I lived, and it was early in the morning of July 21st, 1971. And I guess you need to know that I had tried several times before to get sober in this program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I had failed. I had been trying for about 10 years since I was 19 years old, and I had come and I had gone, and I had stayed for various lengths of time, ranging from several weeks to several months. And I was never able to find a way to stay here and be comfortable with you. And I always had to go out and drink some more and come back again. And I had got to the point that I was hopeless and helpless, and I had no place else to go. And I had tried the psychiatrists and the counselors and the social workers and the clergy and the the courts that tried some things for me as well, and all kinds of things had been gone on in my life for me to try to get sober, and nothing had happened. And it's July 21st, 1971, and I have just finished consuming a bottle of black lemon heart rum. I don't know whether they drink that up here, but as far as I know, God willing, and the creek don't rise, that's the last drink of alcohol I'll ever have to drink for the rest of my life. I hope that's how it's going to be. But I'm walking down that sunny street in Yorkton, Saskatchewan, and I have this ego problem. I don't imagine any of you have an ego problem, but I had an ego problem. It's always amazing me how a guy with puke running down the front of his suit can feel egotistical, but only alcoholics can do that. (laughs) And I want to remind you again that lots of mean old buzzards in AA have talked to me, and lots of mean old counselors have talked to me, and lots of mean old clergy have talked to me, and I've never been able to get the message. 
But I'm walking down that day, and God sent a very special person into my life, and I don't know who she is, but she was about two years old, 19 years ago. Maybe a little older than that, and she had blonde hair, and she was playing in the sandbox in the front of her house as I went staggering by trying to find my home. And she pointed up and said, look at the drunk, to her buddy in the sandbox. And I stopped and looked. I thought, my God, this is a nice neighborhood. What would a drunk be doing over here? <laughs> and I realized that she was talking about me. And for some reason, all the words that I had heard over the last ten years came together in my head, and I had that moment that all of us have had where I met a God of my understanding somewhere deep in my gut, and I desperately wanted to quit drinking alcohol, as drunk as I was. And I went home, and I said to my wife, who had visited the other people already for a while, she was already an Al-Anon. I bought one of them little stickers to put in the back of my camper. It says, Black Belt Al-Anon on board. I just love that thing. (laughs) Tried to get my wife to borrow me a buck to pay for it, (laughs) but she wouldn't. And I came home and I said to her, I want to quit drinking, please phone Alcoholics Anonymous. And she was, you can imagine how thrilled she was. She'd heard this several times before. But I guess she didn't want to fight with me, and she did. And uh, if, not, if I say nothing else this morning that makes any sense to anybody, I hope this does, because I'm ever grateful that my sponsor, who since passed away, Cal Purrington in York, Saskatchewan, wasn't one of those AA people who believed you don't make 12-step calls and people who are real drunk. It one wasn't one of those people who believed that you don't make 12-step calls if the alcoholic himself doesn't call, because if Cal had been one of those persons, I might not be sharing with you this morning, because that was my moment to hear what he had to say. <laughs> and I'd like to tell you that he came over and sat eyeball to eyeball, hand to hand, and knee to knee to knee, and shared with me some deep spiritual insights. It's not exactly what happened. He came over. And I can't swear here because he'd rise in his grave if I did, but he came over and said some real unkind things about my mother. <laughs> and, and suggested to my wife that uh, I should be put to bed and, and that they should call me when I woke up, or they should call him when I woke up. And I went to bed and I slept that last sleep. I hope I ever have to sleep, where you wake up where the sheets are all wet and you have these terrible dreams and nightmares and you sleep for hours but wake up tired. And Cal came over and he took me down to the Dunlop group in Yorkton, Saskatchewan. And in that Dunlop group on June 21st, 1971, the chain that began on June 10th, 1935, and was passed down alcoholic to alcoholic over those intervening years, was again shared with me. And when I stand before you this morning, I'm reminded of the awesome responsibility that I, as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, have, and perhaps some of you may have, as members of Alcoholics Anonymous, to see to it that I'm not the one who breaks the link in that chain and who weakens the primary purpose. Because if someone had weakened the links in that chain between June 10, 1935 and July 21, 1971, there'd have been no phone number for Al Hergott to call. There'd have been no Cal Purrington to come over to my house. There'd have been no message given to me, and I'd be dead from alcoholism someplace. So I'm reminded of that responsibility. It comes with the price of recovery. I want to share a little bit about how I view that responsibility. When I went to Alcoholics Anonymous in York and Saskatchewan, and I need to talk now about what is my opinion and only my opinion about Alcoholics Anonymous. I got AA. I didn't get a lot of other stuff. Nobody asked me if I was black or white or green or purple. Nobody asked me if I was a Catholic or a Protestant or a Jew or if I was young or old or what I thought about anything about politics or lofty spiritual ideals or money or sex or anything else. I don't remember old Cal ever asking me anything about that in the first while. All I remember him saying, again, he referred to my mother. He did that a lot. I think he had some spiritual growth to do at the time. But I remember him asking me a lot in various ways if I had a problem with alcohol. And I was able to mumble some sort of an affirmative response to that. He would then ask me in various ways, did I want to do something about that problem with alcohol? And then when I was able to mumble some sort of an affirmative response to that, he invited me to become a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he sat me down and he shared with me the principles of this program out of a book called Alcoholics Anonymous, and out of books called The Twelve Steps and Twelve Traditions, and out of A comes of age. And he taught me about who we were and where we came from and why we were the way we were. And he taught me something that I hope I never forget. He taught me that the greatest power that Alcoholics Anonymous has is our singleness of purpose. That's the best thing we do. We don't do a whole hell of a lot. We just do but one thing. But we do it better than anybody has ever, ever done before. And sometimes as my hair gets grayer, those that I have left, and as I get older and the tunnel vision of old age begins to descend upon me, I look around and I sometimes wonder whether we're as concerned about our singleness of purpose as we once were. And that worries me a little bit sometimes. 
I know that in my heart, when folks come in who have some other issues going other than alcohol going on in their lives, my heart goes out to them because I see the pain in their eyes and the sadness that I have and that my friends in AA have. But I have to be courageous enough and resolute enough and knowledgeable enough to share with them that there is nothing that Alcoholics Anonymous can do for them except to help them stop drinking alcohol and to maybe help them go someplace else to get the help they need for their other problems. I need to do that. Sometimes it seems to me that other agencies, and I work for one of them bloody other agencies, uh, refer people to us and want us to do things for people that we can't do anything for. And I want to share with you that it's my view that's not their fault and that's not their problem. I think they have the right to make the best referral they can do for their client or for their patient. It's our fault and it's our problem to share with them what this program is all about. And it seems to me that if we're going to share what this program is all about, I know this is too simple for all of you geniuses, but it's not too simple for me. It makes sense to me. We've got to know what the hell the program is all about so we can share with them what we are. I, th I think we have to take the time, as my sponsor did for me, to share with me where we came from, to share with us the impressive link that is so personal to each of us. When I sat in that kingdom last night, I had to think about myself. There's, what, 46 or 50,000, whatever, an enormous amount of people there was from all those countries around the place. And I had to think to myself, all those little lines of messages that came down from Akron, Ohio that night to every individual person. Because I think when I look at all those people, for me, I tend to see all these people. And i got to remember that there's not 46,000 people in that room. There's 46,000 individual recovery stories in that room. There's 46,000 ends of the chains that have come from Bill and Bob down to each of us who sit in this building today who suffer from alcoholism and have who experienced the message of recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous are each the recipient of a little line of communication that came down from Bob and Bill and those early old timers down to us. And it seems to me that while we have that recovery resting within our heart and within our heads, we also have the responsibility to pass that chain on. And I sure as hell wouldn't want to be the one that changes the message of Alcoholics Anonymous to the one who I hand it on to. Because for me, I again, I want to remind you, I had tried a lot of other things, and none of them had worked. And when I came to AA, I had some rights. And the one right that I had, I had the right to get Alcoholics Anonymous and nothing else. And I got that, and I'm ever grateful that the members who sat in fellowship in that group in Yorkton gave me AA. Because if I hadn't got AA, I would have died. And that's why we're called AA, and that's what we have to give people. Our 12 steps, our traditions, from our books, and from nothing else. That's it. So I got some responsibilities. You got some responsibilities. Hell of a word to use in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. If there's a word that'll strike terror into the heart of a drunk, it's responsibility. <laughs> but we got them. And we got to exercise them. So it's my responsibility in my view to work my program. It's my responsibility to recover. That's a hell of a nice responsibility to have. I got to do that first. And it's my responsibility to stay sober so I can help other people to recover. That's my job. And hopefully if I work the steps in our program as well as I can, and if I work them out of the book as well as I can, and if I hang out with the old-timers in AA and listen to what they have to say, I will realize that if I'm sober and if I'm happy, and if all is right in my world this morning, that I'm sober not because of anything I did, but because of the will of a loving God as I understand them and the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's what I have to come to realize in this fellowship. Maybe then I can get humble enough not to try to fix the AA program. I, <laughs> I don't know if any of you suffer from lapses of humility from time to time. <laughs> but <laughs> hard to conceive that. <laughs> but I'm sitting here writing all these spiritual words and I'm going through all our books and I'm it's going to be sober 19 years, God willing, on the 21st of July, and I'm thinking, you know, that should be changed just a little bit. And i got to come snapping back and realize that this thing's been working real good for about 55 years, and i got to keep on doing what, it was, what I'm supposed to do out of the program. Not to change it to change my mood, because they swing from time to time. Not to change it to suit the moods of other people, 
be they members of AA or members out of AA. Sometimes I have a need to be a, have people approve of me. Sometimes I don't want to say to them the things that I need to say to them. And sometimes I don't want to say, I'm sorry, I can't work with your client because he or she has some problem other than alcohol. And this is how AA is, and I have to have the courage just to say that and to stand up for it. I have to accept AA simply as it is. And I've always believed for me that Alcoholics Anonymous is a special gift from God above for those of us who suffer from alcoholism. And I've always had this image in my mind for many, many years of that deal in Akron again. It's just a, to me, it's a, such a fantastic story how that all happened. And I have this image of God who probably held Bill in the palm of his hand and Bob for many years, and Bill was suffering and sliding and trying so hard to get sober. And he was sitting around there in, in Akron that time, and God looked over and said, Good Lord, that schmuck's at it again. I just don't know what I'm going to do with this guy. I think I'm going to invent Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm going to, because they got these big ego problems, I'm going to let them think they invented it. So I'm going <laughs> to... So I'm going to put this drunk on the other end of this deal, and they can sit and talk to each other, and they'll think they're doing this thing really great, but it's always going to be mine. And I'm going to make them remember somehow deep down in their gut that if they ever forget that, they're in deep trouble. So God invented AA as far as I'm concerned in June 10th, 1935. And he invented it for each and every one of us in this room who suffer from alcoholism. And he invented it for each and every one of our families who suffer, who have suffered our alcoholism with him. And if I do those things, maybe I won't screw it up for myself or for those who I'll be privileged to share with. I know what Alcoholics Anonymous' primary purpose is. I know it because I've experienced it. And I think those of you who suffer from alcoholism know what it is because you've experienced it. Each of us have had that moment in our lives, and I'm assuming we wouldn't be here today, where somebody special has walked into our lives and our hearts and our minds are open, like another gift from God as I understand them, so we could hear the message. And each of us have had that eyeball to eyeball, face to face, hand to hand contact where we've heard the primary purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we picked up our beds and we walked away. We are here and we are sober. What's probably most important to me, we're all members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's a precious thing, and I hope I never take it for granted. So it's my responsibility to do what I can, and I'd like to suggest that maybe it's your responsibility to do what you can, to ensure that AA is always there for others who will surely need it, as it was there for us when we needed it. And I want to always remind myself every morning that somebody did that for me. And if they hadn't, I'd be dead, and I wouldn't be here this morning. I thank you so very much for listening to me this morning, and thank Lois at the General Service Office in Eugene for allowing me the privilege to share with you. Very, very special for me. Thank you. <laughs> that handle. I, um, now we've got the pretty part of our program this morning. I had the privilege of serving as a delegate with this lady's husband, and, uh, have had the privilege of riding around Manhattan in the rain in a taxi cab with her, which makes you real close real quick. <laughs> and I'm just delighted to have her here with us this morning. Help me welcome Jan P. Hi, I'm Jan, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Jan. And I must be very daring and courageous to share the podium with these two. Uh, but uh, that's sobriety, and, uh, um, but I'm certainly grateful that I'm here this morning. And as I look out at all of you, if it were not enough to be uh, sharing this podium with these two gentlemen, um, that in itself creates real humility. But looking at all of you is indeed uh, a humbling experience. And I think back to uh, the first time I went to an AA meeting, and I checked you all out to see if you were worthy of my belonging, you know. And uh, my, my, times have changed. So it's, a, it's truly a glorious experience. I'm almost a local here. I'm from Spokane, Washington, which is the other side of the state. And, uh, but since I was a delegate for the Washington area, I feel I can uh, take part in welcoming you here and looking at you. And what has struck me over the past few days is how nice we are to each other and how civil and how loving and how generous. And all of you. It's really uh, very exciting. I got sober in uh, Tucson, Arizona, January 31st, 1966. Um, it was January 31st, and my Christmas tree was still up, which tells you why my life was unmanageable. Um, 
And as I look out at the women in this audience, I'm, I'm not speaking specifically to you, but I hope you can understand that I know what it's like to be a Lady Lush, an Alki Broad, uh, whatever term they wanted to use about us, we knew it was plain hard work. Uh, there's nothing that hard in life uh, as trying to act put together and sophisticated and uh, working and holding down a job and then looking in the back of the sofa cushions to see if you have enough money to buy a half pint, you know? It's very difficult. And uh, so anything that's happened to me since I got sober has been easy compared with the life of a practicing alcoholic woman. And so uh, to all of you, and you look so gorgeous today, and I spent my first uh, six months on the program checking out what you were wearing and, you know, looking at you and being envious. I was the kind of woman that they said, uh, Jan knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. And they were right. It hurt, but they were right. So since that time, I've learned the value of many things. And when Jan was introducing me, she talked about sharing uh, as her experience in New York with my husband, Fran, who uh, is a grapevine director. Uh, we got sober the same day, 24 years ago. He was the one who called AA. As far as I was concerned, it was about the worst thing he had ever done in all our years of marriage. We had been married for 12 years. I thought we had an idyllic marriage. Um, we had not drawn a, drawn a sober breath together in 12 years of that marriage. Uh, we were so um, in tune with each other. At that time, I was working at the library and I often think about uh, I would bring home issues of the National Geographic, and he would sit in one chair, and I would sit in another chair, and we would drink, and we would look at those pictures, and we would lie to each other about all the places we were going to go and all the things we were going to do. And, you know, you think your drinking is perhaps exciting. Ours was so choreographed. I mean, we used the same glass, and we did all the same things night after night after night until one day he called AA using an anonymous name. I mean, that's about as anonymous as you can get. The fellow who came to call on us had a hell of a time finding us, you know, but he finally did, and uh, I opened the door, and, you know, it was very interesting to me that as I was working at that time, and I always worked uh, during my drinking, and um, because one of my reasons, of course, was to have money to drink, and so I always made my job very complicated so that I could never lose it because of drinking, and so it was always music to my ears when uh, I would be off on a Monday morning because I wasn't well, and they would say, oh, God, we just miss you. I mean, we need you here. You know, you just can't be gone a single day. And I would think, good, good, you know, that kind of security. But in any case, this day when Fran called me at the library and said, uh, you know, I've invited someone to come visit us tonight and talk to us about our drinking. It was the pronoun that got me, you know. Uh, I thought that was not appropriate. So I called a cab because I'd long since given up driving. I rushed home, stopping at the liquor store. I got something to drink. I'm thinking I'm going to entertain Ray Land. That's kind of what I had in mind, you know. And... Uh, Got my hostess gown on, uh, put the dishes under the bed, you know. Uh, yes, yeah, true, true, every bit true. Uh, the temptation when you're on a platform with Clancy is to exaggerate, but I swear to you, this is true. This is true. Really true. Absolutely true. One thing I learned in AA that uh, I can't afford to... Uh, to be, uh, you know, glib, uh, because I could always do that. I could always talk, and I could never stay sober. But in any case, when I opened the door of our little adobe house there in Tucson, and the man who was to be our sponsor to change our lives often said he took one look at me and thought, good, two for the price of one. Yeah. You know? uh, it was just, and that's been the story of my life. Um, uh, that had Fran not called AA, I seriously doubt I would have found the humility, nor the courage, nor the honesty to do it then. So I'm grateful that he did that. For me, and I'm grateful for the kind of sobriety that he has lived uh, in our marriage. And so since then, uh, life has been just as you know what it's like. I mean, it is so different, and uh, we are still married, um, and we have adopted two children who are now grown up, and uh, we've gone on to have the kind of life that we always uh, put down when drinking, because we knew we couldn't have it. Is somebody floating? <laughs> Aside from me. Uh, so when we came to uh, the state of Washington, we had been sober uh, six months. Uh, we put everything we owned in a 59 Volkswagen sedan with an epileptic dog and were able to move all our possessions uh, quite handily. And we had been married for 12 years. Uh, so we came here uh, to the state of Washington and uh, started life there, and it, for me it was an, an extraordinary life, because it was the life of a woman who, that I had always looked at and thought, I can never be that kind of woman. I can never be 
uh, consistent. You know, I can never be truly happy one day at a time. Someone said uh, last night that, or earlier this morning, that they were great in a crisis. I mean, I loved crises. I mean, I was good in big dramatic situations. It was day-to-day -day living that baffled me. How people did this, how they created an environment day after day where you knew what was going to happen and people could count on you. And that was so hard for me to achieve. And uh, I always used to think that if only, if only, you know, if only this, if only this, then I would be happy. The truth was that I would never be happy because I had, I had lost my sense of direction. Um, I, I always looked around at other people and thought, how do they do that? How do they manage somehow to be the same? They know that you can count on them. And that's what I wanted, but I didn't know how to achieve it. Now, when I came to the program, uh, service was not mentioned as an option. It was mentioned as what you do to stay sober and to guarantee your sobriety. And, uh, and so we did that. Also, you see, we had never been sober uh, married. And so even though you may have been married for a long time, being sober together is a new experience. So in, and in Tucson, we were considered young. I mean, this was a little time ago. And so we would go to meetings early and set up. And then we would stay late and help clean up. And of course, people would say, aren't they cute? Aren't they nice? And they, here they are, you know, getting sober together, doing all these things. The truth was, we just didn't have any life outside. We just were so terrified of each other. I mean, I'm sure at one point we looked at each other like, have we really been married for 12 years? I mean, this is incredible. You know, but it was always one of those things, whenever I was ready to call it off, he was drunk and talked me out of it whenever I was ready, and he was. So, so we just sort of, by attrition, kept going. And then we were sober together, and then it was, how do you do this? How do you create a marriage uh, based on principles of love and respect and trust? And uh, I love the buttons that we're seeing now which say it's a family affair, because in truth, this weekend for me is a family affair. I have a younger brother in Nevada who's been sober over 20 years. I have a sister-in-law from Nevada who's been sober around five years. I have a young niece who spoke this morning uh, who is sober, and she moved me so deeply this morning because she talked in such a knowledgeable and loving way about the traditions. And I thought, isn't this extraordinary that, that we're all here together? And I have another wonderful sister who baffles us all because she is indifferent to alcohol. I mean, and it's, this is truly a phenomenon I don't understand. I mean, uh, she's not even socially drinking. She's the kind who gets a drink and just lets it sit there. And I'm just fascinated. I mean, how anyone could do that, could be indifferent to a glass of alcohol in front of you for a period of time, and the ice cubes melt, and it gets watered down, and finally say, aren't you going to drink that? I mean, do something. And so uh, that kind of uh, indifference to this has always baffled me, and I knew that I could never have that. You know, I never wanted that. I always wanted total oblivion, you know, and that's what I sought. And so uh, I achieved that for a long time. But then I found sobriety, and I found AA, and I found service, and I found all of you, and I found a loving acceptance that I never dreamed possible. And so I continued on, and my children grew up, and uh, my husband completed his career goal, and things just started happening in our lives, and we bought a house, and we bought a lawnmower. I mean, that was very symbolic, you know. In our neighborhood, that was a, with a true status symbol, that you had a lawnmower, and you had grass, and you mowed it, you know, and, and you were just part of the whole group, and I was a PTA, and I made cookies, and I was the room mother. I was a campfire leader for 12 years, you know. How consistent can you get? And... Uh, so all of those things happened in my life, and they were all part of AA. So they come back to the primary purpose. My primary purpose was to stay sober. And I took that to mean sober in the fullest sense of the word, not merely dry, but sober in the sense of spiritually, emotionally sober, uh, able to deal with life on a daily basis. And then it says to carry this message to the alcoholic who still suffers, to pass it on. And in service... I, I was able to do that in starting groups, and my husband teased me once that um, I started a group of women in my neighborhood, and he says, God, you're just cloning yourself. I mean, they, you know, all these women, I said, but that's because all these women feel safe to come to this meeting, and in time, then they will leave this meeting, and they'll go on to other meetings, and that's indeed what has happened, and uh, the, the age gets younger, and uh, the women get smarter, and they come earlier, and they don't all have to go as far down as we did. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the, the most dramatic aspect of all of this um, has occurred in terms of carrying the message. And some of you uh, heard yesterday um, our friend Rodika from Romania, who spoke about uh, getting the message of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, behind the Iron Curtain. 
uh, from Fran, and then the fact that we have kept in touch with her for five years, and she has been alone in Romania, and she has stayed sober as a loner, all by herself, in communist Romania for five years. Extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, so whenever times are tough, I would, I would think about that. But in our correspondence with Rodika over the years, as we've tried to do that, I must tell you that when Fred and I went to Romania, he was going there to teach, and, and we took our children, and we were going, I was going to run a library there, and we were going to create this great AA environment uh, in Romania, which was totally impossible. But we took AA with us, and we uh, you know, have been very privileged. We've always had all the meetings to go to that we wanted. We've been in service and been involved. And so suddenly here we were in a place where there, not only was there no AA, but AA was forbidden. And so we told our children who were teenagers that, all right, we're going to have a meeting at night at 7 o'clock, and we, we will go in this room, and, and so we don't want to be disturbed during this time. This is our meeting time. We wanted to formalize this. So we went in the bedroom and shut the door and argued for 10 minutes over who was going to chair. You know? <laughs> We decided that whoever was in worse shape got the chair. That's all that. Then we had a big discussion about what we would call this uh, thing we were doing. And being, you know, strictly knowledgeable about this, we argued the fine points of a meeting versus a group. You know, what are you if you're a group? Would you meet these requirements? Or what if you're a meeting? And uh, we finally decided that we would be a Grupa Una, which is Group 1. Nothing modest about this. Group 1 in Romania. And Grupa Una still exists today and uh, with Juliet. And we hope that when she goes back after her visit here, that she will be able to have more members of, of Grupa Una. But we would have this wonderful format. And Fran was really better at it than I was. He would open the meeting, and uh, then he would uh, call on me. And then... Uh, <laughs> He would call on Bill W. We had a tape of Bill W. And we, we portioned it out. Uh, and then he would ask if there were any announcements for the good of the fellowship. And uh, he'd pass the basket. And we would uh, close up the meeting. And we did that. And we thought it was necessary to do that. And my heart goes out to loners and internationalists who stay sober, you know, by themselves, with the material, and with occasional contact. But for me, anyway, it was necessary to formalize that AA meeting because the magic for me is in the meetings. And there's certainly magic in this room today for me and uh, as I look around at, at all of you. So when we came back from America and we left Fran there and uh, he was able to carry the message to Rodica and then the story just grows and grows and people in the Washington area got involved in her story and then we have the international and things fall into this great pattern, this wonderful pattern which I was always looking for in my life, always looking for some sense that uh, there was an order in life and never understanding why. And I thought Al's remarks were, were wonderful in terms of what we know we have in AA and our responsibility to guard it and pass it on to the next person. Um, and we're talking a lot about humility today, and as I say, I think it's, it's something for me to always keep in mind because it's heady stuff to be around all of you, and you begin to think somehow that maybe you're doing something. And uh, that's always dangerous territory for me. I have to remember that left to my own devices, I would still be sitting in that living room, reading those National Geographics, drinking out of that same glass. Um, I was unable to change my life. It took all of you to do that. Actually, I'm having a little help with humility these days because I am running for political office and my face is all over the sides of buses, three feet tall. And if you think coming at yourself 30 miles an hour is not a humbling experience, uh, <laughs> And all your imperfections are larger than life. And my children told me that, Mother, this is really weird. I mean, to be sitting somewhere and to see this your mother coming at you on a bus, you know? It's like, gives new meaning to Big Brother, I must tell you. So, so that has helped me. And uh, this morning has helped me as I, as I look at all of you. And I, cannot, I can only think, um, always when I was drinking, it was always, why me? Why me? God, why me? Why are all these terrible things happening to me? And now I truly look at you and I think of this weekend and the opportunity to speak to you when any one of you could say more than I'm saying to you today. And I just can only thank God. Why me? Thank you. I told her she was in the wrong political party, but I'd even move up here and vote for her. <laughs> I liked her so well. My primary purpose here this morning is to just chair this meeting. However, I was encouraged to share a little bit about myself with you. Um, as I told you who I am and how long I've been sober, uh, I am also married to a member of this fellowship. Uh, if you want to uh, 
do marriage the hard way to get two people over 40 trying to grow up in the same house. Uh, <laughs> I'm obviously the baby of this group, sobriety-wise, people up here. Uh, I am currently serving as a Southwest Regional Trustee, Class B. I've been asked a lot about that, and I give them the same answer that was given to me, that it Class A's are non-alcoholic and Class B's are alcoholic, and it has nothing to do with your intrinsic worth. <laughs> it has strictly to do with the laws of incorporation in the state of New York. I choose to view it as rank discrimination. <laughs> I live in El Paso, Texas. Yesterday I had on a big pin that said Texas and rhinestones. It was given to me by the group of ladies that I play cards with when I was elected trustee. They said they wanted people to know who I was and where I was from when I went places. My husband said that the only way he could figure out they wouldn't know was if I didn't open my mouth. <laughs> and we've yet to find me in that situation. <laughs> well, we've talked a lot. Everybody's mentioned humility this morning. <laughs> And uh, it gives me great pleasure <laughs> to bring to you Mr. Humility himself, Lancey I. My name is Clancy Emerson. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Not too much applause. I've only got an hour. You can turn your tape on now, Dick. <laughs> yeah. July 21st, I was walking through the streets of Saskatoon. No, those are your notes. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know why I talk about I would like to say really seriously that the two talks we've just heard, I think are the two best talks I've heard in this convention. <laughs> I, uh, I hope the talks tomorrow morning in the Kingdom are as good as those were about Alcoholics Anonymous, because that's what we're here for. I'm uh, very glad to be here this morning. Uh, I'm glad our Southwest Trust Trustee Jan, Jan is directing the meeting. Her accent has a warm and wonderful spot in my heart when I lived in El Paso and directed a grand opera at the university there. <laughs> And shortly after that, I was taken to the psychiatric ward. <laughs> and uh, we're going to hit you. And I, I was naive enough to think that that meant some constructive growth process that turned out to be a lot of electric shock treatments. And they put me away in Big Spring State Mental Hospital where I spent a lot of time. And, and I would like to get even with the people who put me there, but when you've had a lot of shock treatments, you forget who they were. You just... <laughs> The one thing I'll say about that experience, so they, they, I was not put in the nut house for drinking, I was put in there for psychiatric reasons, and they had me in there as a suicide, and my diagnosis was split personality, bad schizophrenia. And I've often said that I'd like to go back to El Paso sometime at the El Paso County Hospital and find that old psychiatrist who must be pretty old and feeble now, I should be able to move him around pretty good, <laughs> and say, you old quack, you, know, you call me a split personality, a dual personality, you ought to lose your license. God, if I could have got my personalities down to two, I'd have made it. <laughs> yeah, I, my problem has always been this committee that forms in my head at the sign of the, any frustration whatsoever. Let's get out of here. Don't think we can. Yes, I think we can. I don't know. Don't quit them. I, uh, I hear people in AA today say, maybe I need group therapy. Maybe this isn't enough. Well, I've never needed group therapy. I just go for a ride alone in my car. You know? <laughs> That's true. But we are here this morning to discuss what I think is probably the most, in my opinion, the most important single aspect of recovery, which is the primary purpose. Many people travel around the country, and I do a little bit, and see, see the traditions under a great deal of attack all over the country, all over the world where AA is. Now I've lost my place and have to start over again. <laughs> my name is Clancy Emerson. 
Yeah. But this is a serious proposition because, in my opinion, the language, the language that we speak here is what makes Alcoholics Anonymous, that differentiates it. The, uh, we sometimes forget what a, what a fragile gift this was, as mentioned last night at the Kingdom, that there were ten calls made. The tenth call is the one that got through. And if I've stood in the Mayflower Hotel in Akron years ago and tried to visualize what it must have been like. He wasn't just lonely and frustrated. The deal he came out to Akron on, he had just blown. He didn't have enough money to get the train fare back to New York. He was wiped out. And he stood in the lobby of this Mayflower Hotel, and over there, there's a door that says cocktails in a little red neon sign, cheap little neon sign. And he started to walk in there, as he said later. And over here in the wall are some telephones. But he promised his friends in New York he'd go over there and make a call, so he called and got hung up on and rejected several times and treated like a piece of junk. And I'll tell you, most people like me, and I presume like many of you, would have said, I did the best I could. I did the best I could. I will just have a couple drinks while I decide what to do next. And uh, it's funny, but it isn't funny. That's a fragile, thin line. Boy, we wouldn't be here at all with a fragile, thin line of Roland accidentally bumping into Ebby in Vermont in the only two-week period that he ever was there that, well, Ebby wasn't there. Or the fragile experience of Ebby having to testify to the Oxford movement and happening to remember that he had his old friend Bill Wilson in that city. A series of fragile, very fragile threads and so he finally, on that tenth call or whatever it was, got a hold of this somebody who was going to put him in touch with this drunken doctor who he could see the next day. And here it was, a Saturday afternoon, and he was hot, about ten bucks in his pocket, desperate, afraid, lonely, nobody cares. And I'll tell you, I would have, I, I don't know what I'd have done, but I suspect I would have run. I would have run, and I suspect most of you would have run. And this, this would have just been a fantasy in somebody's mind, this meeting today or this convention or anything that deals with our recovery. But somehow they got this fragile thing together. And he went out and talked to this drunken doctor, as we know. And the man that drove the drunken doctor there was on the stage last night. Uh, young Bob. Now he's old, but he was young Bob then. <laughs> but uh, I've talked to him about that. He, he's the only surviving member of the, that whole group that watched the meet. And uh, later when Bill moved into their house, which was kind of a lucky break for Bill, he didn't have train fare to go anywhere else. But I said to Bob, you know, I said, that must have been what a great moment for you. This, You were present at the beginning of one of the greatest spiritual movements of all time, certainly in the century, and you were there. It must have been exhilarating. And he said, no, no, it wasn't. He said, I, I thought it was kind of crappy. <laughs> he was 16 years old. He said, my dad was sober, but he was sober a lot anyway. He was a periodic. And this guy from New York was a nice guy, a little intense for my taste. <laughs> And he said, you can never bring anybody home after school. There's always somebody on the sofa smelling like peraldehyde while they hovered over him. Or somebody crawling down the rain spout to get away from these fanatics. <laughs> but of course, God moved slowly but surely to punish heresy. Young Bob never drank. He grew up and married an alcoholic and is now an Al-Anon. <laughs> well, I suspect Bob, God overreacted. <laughs> the, uh, but I was with Bob and his charming wife last Saturday night in Wichita Falls, Texas, and we laughed about this, and it's, a, it's always a touching story to me. But what, what was the big deal? I mean, you hear about, so here's Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob stay sober a couple weeks. They sit around and discuss spiritual matters, Oxford Group spirituality matters, and pretty soon Dr. Bob is drunk again on a train, and pretty soon he's sobered up again. In fact, his sponsor bought him his last drink to steady his hand so he could do the surgery he had to do that morning. I told my sponsor about that story years later, and he, uh, he said, I don't think you're going to do any surgery. Sweat it out. <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> but then Dr. Bob stayed sober, and, and a lot of people think, well, I guess he stayed sober because uh, he got that Oxford Group message. Bill told Dr. Bob about the Oxford group, and then he stayed sober. But there's one thing that, if you're kind of new, you might not realize. Dr. Bob was already a spiritual leader of the Oxford movement when he was drunk. This, he wasn't hearing anything new. He heard nothing new at all, just that somebody else was sober. As he wrote later, and said later, what, could, what impressed him about Bill Wilson 
was that he, Bill Wilson, sounded as though he knew how he, Dr. Bob, felt. They had, he felt a communication, one had the feelings about drinking that he had, and he was staggered by it. And they realized sitting around discussing spiritual matters didn't keep anybody sober. It hadn't kept Bill sober in New York. He'd been picking guys off bar stools, none of whom stayed sober, but Bill did. And so they went up and got this Bill D. in the hospital. This guy from Kentucky, lawyer from Kentucky, I heard him talk many, many years ago. And he said something effective. Well, them two fellers came in my bed. I thought they were going to talk to me about my drank, and everybody else had. And they never talked to me about my drinking once. They talked to me about their drinking and how they felt. And I just couldn't believe it. They sounded just like me. And he said, I decided to stick with them fellers. He's been with them ever since. Until he died. And on and on, not everybody who got the message. Most of those people got drunk in those early days, like they do now. Most people get drunk today. Except most of them died drunk. I've heard it said that, I guess it's correct, that the, those first so-called hundred, really 79, who were sober a year when the book was written, most of them died drunk. Not because AA doesn't work, but because of the nature of the illness. But the thing that makes AA work at all, it come, turns out to be, is there is something here that has never been present anywhere. The data that is available here has been available for centuries, for, you know, all sorts of places. What makes Alcoholics Anonymous different, what makes it unique and special to us today, is exactly as it was on July 10th, or June 10th, rather, 1935, when Dr. Bob came off that last trunk. And i got to remember this, because this is what I've come to believe so implicitly, and I suppose, I hope you at least consider it. Alcoholics Anonymous is not the book. It's a nice book, but you can own that book. I owned it for years and never got sober. I read it and still didn't get so. It isn't meetings. It isn't people. It isn't love. It isn't understanding. It isn't spirituality. All of these things are adjuncts to Alcoholics Anonymous. These are great supportive aspects of Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous is today, as the same as it was on June 10th, 1935, it is one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic to help him reduce his feelings of difference at least enough so that he will begin to take actions he does not yet believe in. And that really is what's lost when we attempt to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous to people who are not alcoholics. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's just... But the number, to me, one of the great problems of all alcoholics, if you are like me, it's one of your great problems, and it has been all your life, a deep-seated feeling of, yes, but my case really is different. It's different in AA, and it's different out of AA, and they mean well when they're trying to help me, but they don't really understand. And that's what kills people. Monday, you know, I go to work in the morning, and I step over bodies dying outside my office. And you would think that I should be able to help them, but they are immersed, they are beyond help in their immersion in yes, but my case is different. And anyone who goes out to drink knows that their case is different. Chapter 3 describes people whose case is different. Because they all can prove in the last analysis, my problem really isn't alcohol. I have deep-seated feelings and emotions and I, you don't understand. I know you can help me with your drinking. I was in and out of AA for years, had great people try to help me. But in my mind's eye, I was able to fend off everything. Because you can always prove, yes, I am sure AA works for people whose problem is drinking, but it doesn't work for people who have deep and intense problems in addition to the drinking and what brings about the drinking. And so people like me, and I presume like many of you, live in this feeling of difference. The purpose of the great goal of Alcoholics Anonymous, it seems to me, that the thing that must be hurdled is somehow enable the patient to begin to understand maybe I'm not as totally different as I feel. Maybe it isn't as, maybe there is someone who understands. One of the, I think one of the great things of a sponsor, if you have a sponsor you can respect, that the day comes when he says, oh yes, I, I understand, and you believe he really does understand. Because all of my life I heard people say, yes, yes, I understand, and I thought, no you don't, not really. You think you do, you understand the story I gave you because that's what I want you to know. But nobody really understands because I don't understand. I just have these feelings. And when I drink, 
it alleviates them and it fills the holes that sobriety makes that make me unable to live. And this feeling of difference, I think, is the curse, and it'll never go totally go away. If you think it's gone away, just wait till the next time you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And it'll be right there again. And we all have days where things aren't working out, and the signal comes again. Maybe you're not, maybe this isn't for you after all. Mm. Well, maybe you've just wasted 31 years on a false illusion. But that is not, of course, the case. I think the best analogy I know about that is, is one alcoholic talks to another. Why, you know, today, many treatment facilities, I guess, as Al said, they're trying to do the best they can for their patient, or they're trying to do the best, to at least get some kind of recovery ratio, so they send people to Alcoholics Anonymous. In our area, and I'm sure in your area, because I hear it all over the world, they take people who are not alcoholics at all and say, just go tell them you're an alcoholic, then they can't throw you out. Whatever your problem is, overeating, narcotics, whatever, just tell them you're an alcoholic. And it sounds good. They come to me and say, I'm an alcoholic, can't throw me out. But they never get it. And they live in pain and they live in feeling different and they exude something. You know, it's an amazing thing how that difference is. Al alluded to it this morning. But the non-alcoholic trustee last night, wonderful man, chairman of our board of trustees, just a fine man, a hardworking man. But when he said he was a non-alcoholic trustee, it's as though there was a dim somebody turned down the sound in the hall. Uh, nothing to do with him. And he is a wonderful man. But you could, and then he finally got done with his remarks. Excellent. Not, nothing you could take exception to at all. Fine remarks. Flinched a little bit when he said we. But. Uh, But he, but he got done, and he said, and now uh, I'd like to introduce Ruth B. And you can just feel the surge come back up. Because ah! there's that identity. It's an odd thing. People like us who've spent our lives fighting against the term alcoholic get to a point where the worst put down you can give to someone is to say, I don't even think she's alcoholic. <laughs> Yeah. Because there's a lang it's the language of one alcoholic talking to another. You, you, you know, all of the all of the major other twelve step programs have been started by people who are in AA, who felt they other people like them needed help. The guy that founded Gamblers Anonymous, member of AA. I knew him well. Married to a very distinguished now at that time married to a woman who is now the longest sobriety of any woman in the world. And he found a GA. And it was just for people who needed identification. Uh, OA was founded by, within a couple blocks of the 6300 Club of Los Angeles. Uh, NA was founded by members of AA and North Hollywood Clubhouse. All of these were founded by people who realized they could not identify with drinking. In fact, I began to get my first understanding of that about, about 1960, OA didn't have many recoveries at that time. I don't think they had any by the looks of them. <laughs> I'm not judging, I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, glad the, uh, I'm glad the signer didn't see that gesture. <laughs> yeah. oh, <you're> <laughs> But anyway, but they asked AA members to come over and talk at the first meetings of OA. I was over and talked to them. And, you know, I was skinny then and didn't have any friends. I, was, I went over and talked to these about a couple of years sober, and they had, I talked to maybe their third or fourth meeting and then for several. But they're kind of plump ladies sitting around a room, and uh, I talked, they asked me to talk about obsessions, because they seemed to feel I was an authority on that. <laughs> not, the, not the recovery from obsessions, just obsessions. And uh, I talked at this OA meeting, and I sat down. And I thought, I think that really helped. And then they talked. And I was appalled. I never heard of anything like that. I mean, this woman said, and then I, I ate this whole chicken, and I, I ate a cake. And I thought to myself, you sick puke. Yeah. 
<laughs> and some woman, some woman said, I ate till I couldn't eat anymore. I went and put my cigarette on my throat and made room for more food. And I thought, boy, you ought to be in the nut house, you know. I can understand doing that drinking, but eating? Yeah. Oh. Why don't you just eat like a man? And I also talked at early GA meetings. No guy had me come over to the GA meetings, and I, I was appalled listening to their discussion, you know. And I, I got back in my feet, and I, I went to Gardena, and I started playing the low ball again. <laughs> and it all went, and I thought, Gee, you know, a guy like you shouldn't even gamble. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to tell you something. I was there talking about obsessions to people that I intellectually understood their problem. But I could have sat till next Christmas, and I would never have identified with the nature of their relief, because it doesn't do that to me. That's why we have alcoholic to alcoholic. <laughs> I've talked to narcotics, early meetings of Narcotics Anonymous. I've talked to the 1970s, the beginning of CA, Cocaine Anonymous. And it's the same thing. I understand them, and I, I want good for them, but I also know I don't identify with them. Because the same way that I expect non-alcoholics to write, don't you understand why I'm doing this? They don't understand. Because there's that old thing we've said before. The difference between non-alcoholics and me has a number of things, but it boils down to one thing. When they drink alcohol, it goes... <laughs> and they say, no more for me, I'm starting to feel it. <laughs> And when I drink alcohol, it doesn't go, blah, 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 blah. it goes. <laughs> and all the discussion in the world and intellectual knowledge will never change that. That is why you cannot have mixed meetings. That's why. Really, Alcoholics Anonymous meetings require, in my opinion only, alcoholics to talk at Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. I don't want to hear a doctor. I don't want to hear a clergyman. I mean, I love them. I don't want to hear an Al-Anon. I don't want to hear an al I want to hear an alcoholic talking to alcoholics, explaining what to do about it. Because that is our primary purpose, to carry the message to the people who still suffer. You know, it's an interesting thing. If you ever read that old thing in the, that first version of the big book, I know some of you have seen that. I think the 12th step, as I recall, that's the way Bill originally wrote it, because he was a great, you know, he wanted to help all mankind. And 12th step, having had his spiritual steps, we try to carry this message to other people, he said, to, I guess to the world. And somebody, when they talked it over, and Dr. Bob and the people around at that time, they changed that to uh, alcoholics. Somehow they had intuitive feeling. In the 1940s, before the traditions, or the late middle 1940s, before there were any traditions, someone sent an article about the Washingtonians to Bill Wilson. He had never heard of it, apparently. And he read about a movement in 1840 that had worked successfully with alcoholics, unlike anything in the world's history. And they had come to grow, and they similar in many ways to AA. People went to each other's groups and talked to each other's towns. They assumed there were maybe a 100,000 sober alcoholics by 1845, much faster rate of recovery than AA ever had. And they got immersed in other things, politics, temperance, anti-slavery stuff, and helping people with other problems. And by 1848, to all intents and purposes, the group had been expired. There were few people left. But... Uh, why was that? Abraham Lincoln addressed the Washingtonians in 1846 about slavery movement. And that's really was the germ of the Twelve Traditions. He began writing the Twelve Traditions after he, and he, much of the experience the Washingtonians had became part of our traditions. Because he had seen it in AA, I guess he hadn't quite crystallized it, about getting involved in other matters, about doing other things, about being, being caught up in Less, you know, one of the things that killed the Washingtonians is because they vied for 
who would get the most publicity for the speakers and so on. And they, that's why one of the reasons we got our anonymity as a spiritual concept. We wouldn't vie for that sort of thing. And certainly with the great ones, one of the great ones is our primary purpose is to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous to alcoholics who still suffer, drunk or sober, I suppose. doesn't mean necessarily drunk and alcoholics. It means those of us who are suffering, and each of us suffer from time to time and need the same message we already know. But it's the language of Alcoholics Anonymous. That is the primary purpose of why we are here and why we do these things. We say, what well, we come to learn about sobriety? I'm going to tell you something. I have not heard anything new that I can think of in an AA meeting in a quarter of a century. I really haven't. I haven't heard anything new. If I'm there to hear new facts every time and new information, I'm out of luck. What I'm here is to hear the language of the heart, as they described it in the International Convention a few times back. The language of one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic to remind me I'm not so different, that I'm not as big as I think I am, that my problems are not so gross, and to center me back into a feeling of, yes, I am who I am and it's all right to be me. Now, in order to bring this about, we must have Alcoholics Anonymous, I suppose it's, Alice said, and Jana said, and I'm sure we, most of us believe. I'm sure anyone who would go to a meeting like this is a right-wing fascist pig anyway. <laughs> we're not, we're not uh, converting anybody. They're all at the real meetings. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the, uh, I don't know why I said that. Take that off the tape, Dick. <laughs> the only advantage of sponsoring the taper here is that you can edit your remarks later. Uh, But that's what we do here. We gather together, share our experience, strength as one to help us reduce our feelings of difference. And we will never completely reduce them, and they will always be there, and we will always face conflicts in our lives that will bring them back to varying degrees. But there's something to do about it. And that's why it is terribly, terribly dangerous, in my opinion, to have people who do not carry this message as much as we love them or need them. I sit in meetings sometimes, places now, and I hear I get up and talk about narcotics for 55 minutes, and he talks about the steps, he talks about purity. But I really haven't identified with him anything. I've identified with some of the things he does. But I think about the newcomer. The newcomer does not identify with that. I wouldn't identify with that. What finally enabled me to identify with it is that a man finally convinced me that he knew how I felt. And on that basis, I began to take actions I would never have taken for anybody else. And I know the language is comes this way. So, this is the applause signal, you dummy. <laughs> I don't know why I do that. God damn it. <laughs> I'll tell you a good example. Why, I have three daughters at this convention. They're in this hall tonight. One got his first birthday about three weeks ago. One got her first birthday about a week ago. One's having her first birthday in a couple days. Now, no, no, don't. <laughs> they have done nothing worthy of your applause. <laughs> That's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is... I've sponsored a lot of people over the years. Maybe they haven't turned out well, but <laughs> I've sponsored them. And I travel around a lot, and I know a lot about AA, and I'm a repository of great wisdom, I think. And I, uh, I know nuances of the psyche that would stagger Dr. Jung. <laughs> and I talk to my three daughters, and I say, boy, are they lucky they got a father who knows AA in and out. And I say, now here's what you do in this situation. And I say, we don't want to hear it, Dad. Because I'm not an AA to them. I'm their dad. And nobody listens to dads. I don't think that's right, Dad. I'm going to call my sponsor. She's got three years. My oldest daughter and I are sharing a room at this convention. She's an attorney in the, or a DA or something in Albuquerque. Now, this morning... You know, I'm getting up and I'm feeling good and positive. I'm saying to her, now here's what we're going to do. We'll, we'll get a hold of the other kids and we'll go over and have a... And I, she demurred and I pointed out a little more strongly. She said, well, you certainly know how to ruin a morning, don't you? And I tried to explain to her, I am not just your father. I'm Clancy I from up in the sky. But it's a perfect example. My intellectual knowledge doesn't help. She has to identify with a sponsor who has saved her bacon. And all of those girls do. And that's exactly the way it should be. That's why fathers can never help children and children can never help parents. Because there's all sorts of emotions involved. 
it boils down to something else. And that also, of course, is the same reason why in our traditions it specifically states that we have special groups in the international lawyers in AA, international doctors in AA, air, airline birds of a feather, they all have meetings here, uh, actors, so on. And it's not like that should really be a great thing because they can get together with peers and they can really do it. But every one of those organizations say, we only are going to help you identify. You've got to get into Alcoholics Anonymous. You've got to get beyond this. Do you know why that is? Because if they stay there, they will reinforce their feelings of being different. It's different to be a pilot. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that as an attack, but that's what they say within their own organization. The successful members say that. Uh, Dr. Hal M. was a guru in the Washington area. He forces them out of there quickly and gets them out. And that's why we got to... We must take the actions that help us reduce the feelings of being different, and we must get the information from people who we believe understand how we feel. It's not an attack on anybody, but that's why they formed other organizations so that they can, so they can identify and take actions they would not ordinarily take based on intellectual understanding or appreciation. The, uh, the bottom line, the bottom line for each and every one here that we have to remember when we get out of here, when we have to, when we go forth into the back into the world tomorrow afternoon, we're not going out there to be the harbingers of saving the world. Sometimes people say, in a few years, AA will take over the world. Everybody will live by these principles. You can't even get a guy dying from alcoholism to live by these principles. <laughs> yeah. We better not worry about whether the city council in Chicago is going to do it. We better see if I can do it. But we're not, we can be do better, we can live more comfortably, we can live with more understanding, we can live with more appreciation, we can try to assume that uh, the prayers are better to be under, or to understand than to be understood and to love and be loved and so on. But the primary purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous, in my opinion, as I said before, and I'm saying as I close early, I might point out. <laughs> <laughs> she has her finger over the red button, I, I ignite in four minutes. The primary person for me to go forth is the same as it was when Bill Wilson sat and talked to Dr. Bob coming off a drunk in Akron, Ohio, and they went to do Bill D and on and on up until the time your sponsor talked to you and you talked to a newcomer. And it's this. My primary purpose is not to be wonderful, loving, spiritual, kind. My primary purpose is to be part of the chain of one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic to help him reduce his feelings of difference at least enough so that he will begin to take actions that will help him stay alive for the rest of his life. I am most pleased to be part of that chain. I'm pleased you're part of that chain. I'm pleased to be part of this international convention. First convention I went to, the speaker I heard was Bill Wilson and Ebby. And that turned me around, and today I feel the same feeling. I feel love and enthusiasm and zeal to get out there and try it again, and I hope you do too. Thank you. Give him a bad, bad time, but he makes a hell of an AA talk. I can't tell you how much I appreciate all three of our speakers this morning. Thank you. I want to thank you all for coming here this morning. I see a lot of friends that I know and a lot of friends I haven't met yet. And we're delighted that all of you are here. And would you join me? Let's close this meeting in the usual way. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.